Yeah, good afternoon, scholars. Uh, Walter Bown here. So, Tom Buchanan, if you've been paying attention, you've been picking up on a lot of his white nationalism, his racism, his snobbery, his just complete and utter vileness as a human being. Let's talk about this. Because what was happening in 1922, and perhaps what is happening now, let's begin really where Tom Buchanan is first introduced. In my version, uh, it's on page five in chapter one. He says, I drove over to have dinner with the Tom Buchanans. All right, so Daisy is like a part of the Buchanan. So Daisy, not even like she's a person, but you know, it's like a piece of property. And he says, I, I knew Tom in college, right? And I spent a couple of days with them in, in Chicago. So these are like old friends who he didn't really even know at all, which is, you know, a paradox, right? It's described on the top of page six. He had various physical accomplishments. He was a powerful tight end that played football, that ever played football at Yale. And people knew him nationally, right? And he said, as a criticism, He's one of these men who reach an acute, limited excellence. Notice that oxymoron. Like, he achieved his fame and, like, his glory early, but then everything else was anticlimax. It's like you were the baseball star in high school, and then it's like that Bruce brings things on, glory days, and it's like you keep trying to go back to your glory days. But this acute, limited excellence, he is limited in his ability and his ability is mostly in being physical and, f and abusive. He will be physically abusive in this novel, as we will see, and mentally abusive. He has polo ponies. If you're that rich that you can just bring polo ponies, it just shows just the amount of wealth we're talking about. And we're talking about here the one percenters. Well, we also see Nick commenting, and it's a criticism. It's a, it's a criticism that... Fitzgerald had as well, who never really felt he fit in with the wealthy crowd, that there, there's this canard that he was a suck up to the rich. But Tom drifted here and there unrestfully wherever people played polo and were rich together. Right? So that is a you know an insightful criticism that they're restless and they're just all together, right? These super rich. Right. He says, again, still on page six with this characterization, that he had this dramatic turbulence, that he's looking, always looking for some irrevocable, irrecoverable, not irrevocable, irrecoverable football game. He's trying to find a football game that he can demonstrate just how great he is. But of course, that doesn't exist anymore. And if you think about it, Tom will make this novel turbulent. It's dramatic. So if it wasn't for Tom's actions, or largely a part, I mean, a large part of it, um, so he had this turbulence, this, this violence in football. He wants it again later in life, in his personal life. And we see, we first see Tom Buchanan at, at the bottom of page six in riding clothes. He's been riding horses with his legs apart on the front porch. Having that legs, ap you know, legs apart shows his dominance. So if you think of someone standing and their legs are fall up, far apart, it's just like you're ready for a showdown, right? He said he hadn't changed much. He has straw hair, 30 hard mouth, and a supercilious manner, right? The word supercilious is, is very interesting, but notice all these words that Fitzgerald is having uh, Nick use is all negative, right? He has shining, arrogant eyes that is always that always seems to be leaning aggressively forward. And there was something, not even the effeminate swank of his riding clothes, like his tight riding clothes, like we would think of yoga pants or something like that. Um, even, his, even, even that kind of female look 
couldn't hide the enormous power of that body, which seemed to fill those glistening boots. So it's not only Daisy that's glistening, Tom also glistens. And the boots are straining under all this muscle, shifting with his shoulders. And he writes, it was a body capable of enormous leverage, M dash, a cruel body. We will see this cruelness throughout the novel, time and time again. So the first inkling we get of Tom Buchanan, even his name, is a weapon. Okay, get it? It also has, you know, historical overtones, uh, presidential. And then he goes on to the voice. He has a gruff, husky tenor. And he has, like, there's a paternal contempt in his voice, like, very fatherly. Um, and people at college hated his guts, right? So this is a guy who isn't liked, but doesn't really care that he's liked because he's so powerful, he can just destroy people. What I find interesting here, I just thought about it, um, it's a cliche to say you hate someone's guts, but it's not like you're saying they hated him as a person or they didn't like what he had to say. They're, the guts is this Anglo-Saxon word, I believe, that's just about the body, about internal organs. It's, it's, so the physical specimen that is Tom Buchanan is recognized for the thing that is hated, all right? I might be reading into that a little, little much, but that's something we say, we hate your guts. But think about what that actually says, right? Right. However, Nick says, is, is, I got the impression that he wanted to like me, right? Kind of weird. And we get that in chapter two when he just, you know, takes Nick along for uh, a joyride to meet his um, girlfriend. Right. We see again Tom Buchanan on, chapter, on, on page eight. There was a boom, you get it, cannon, boom, as Tom Buchanan shut the rear doors and caught, and the caught wind died about the room. All right, you're asking me, hey, Bound, so what's the big deal? He shuts the door and keeps the wind down. All right, because Daisy and Jordan were floating, not really, but figuratively, symbolically, in the room. He comes in, boom, the wind is caught dies, and the, the curtains, everything seems to settle down. He is a destroyer, right? He is not a creator. He's not a caretaker. Tom Buchanan is a destroyer, right? So he even makes what was lively in the room dead. We see him again, and he comes flittering in and out of the chapter because uh, Nick is you know, interested in Jordan and talking to his second cousin, and there's some uh, witty banter here. Looking on page 12 of my edition, when Daisy says, look, she complained, I heard it, showing, like, her thumb, finger, what was it? That's uh, her little finger. And he says, you did it, Tom. I know you didn't mean to, but you did it. That's what I get from marrying a brute of a man, a great, big, hulking, physical specimen. Look at all those adjectives. They're not positive adjectives describing her husband, right? using uh, amplification, it's called, in rhetoric. You know, a brute of a man, a great big, you say things and then you add onto it. And then Tom says, not, I'm sorry, honey, I'm sorry for hurting your little finger, but he objects crossly. I object to the word hulking. Like, I don't wanna, I, I hate you talking, even in kidding. And then Daisy says, hulking, just to kind of like put salt in his wound, okay? So again, this is, this information is important because hurting Daisy's little finger, that's bad, but not nearly as bad as what he'll do in chapter two. Tom says, notice too, when she breaks off, she can't even say the word man. She just breaks off because to give him that dignity of saying man, I think that's significant. On page 12. And this is very important. Civilization is going to pieces. Tom broke out violently. There is an adverb, violently. I've gotten to be terrible pessimistic about things. 
Have you read The Rise of the Colored Empires by this man, Godard? In the 1920s with eugenics, there was this anti-Semitic, this anti-immigrant. It was the German Bund who wanted to use George Washington as the savior of the white man, right? And the, the Ku Klux Klan, the birth of the nation. So the racism and the white nationalism and white lives matter. This is not new, everyone. This is not new. Just break this down for a second and also take a look at, you know, what Fitzgerald is doing here. It's like, okay, you have the word pieces, broke, violent, terrible. So all of these words, right, whether it's an adverb or an adjective or a noun, all describe Tom Buchanan, right? And the very thing that he criticizes, civilization's going to pieces not because of African Americans or brown people, it's because of people like Tom Buchanan, right? And there were scientific studies, when I put that in quotes, that wanted to prove that the African American brain and, you know, brown people's brains were smaller, and it was the white man's burden, and you can read, uh, hear, read about Real Kipling um, in Jungle Book, and it was England's duty to civilize India because England had Shakespeare and civilization and the King James Bible. And the irony is, Tom Buchanan is a complete idiot. He went to Yale only because they're multimillionaires. And if you're a multimillionaire, you buy your way in, into a school. You know how it goes. Yep. All right. And then Nick is like, no, I haven't heard of this. And then Tom says, well, it's a fine book. Everyone ought to read it. The idea is that we don't look out. The white race will, he can't even continue, will be utterly submerged. It's all scientific stuff. It's been proved. So he is part of this 1% who was afraid of losing his power, his position, and it's all based on race. As we continue as a nation and as the world continues with multiculturalism and people intermarrying, we get less white. And for me, hey, that's fantastic. Right, but for a Tom Buchanan, this is this is utter disaster, and we're going to lose civilization because it's white people who've done all this great stuff, right? And Daisy teases Tom here, says Tom's getting very profound. He reads deep books with long words in them. What was the word? And then he continues, these books are scientific, right? This fellow's worked it out. It's up to us who are the dominant race to watch out or these other races will have control of things. Wow. Okay. And then Daisy is still joking. We've got to beat them down, whispered Daisy, winking ferociously. There's that other great oxymoron toward the fervent sun. Right. And Tom continues his racism. The, this idea is that we're Nordics you know, white people, I am, you are, and you, and he's looking around the room. After an infinitesimal hesitation, again, fantastic oxymoron run, infinitesimal hesitation, he included Daisy with a slight nod, and she winked at me. And we've produced all the things that go to make civilization. Oh, and he's thinking, signs and art and all that. Do you say, do you think Tom Buchanan listens to Mozart? Do you think he reads Shakespeare? Do you think he can comprehend quantum physics or anything that goes to make civilization? Absolutely not. He doesn't understand anything, and he gets things totally wrong throughout the novel. He switches things, right? So we see here in the very early pages Fitzgerald acknowledging the deep-seated racism of the 1920s that was illustrated with Henry Ford and Charles Lindbergh and uh, Woodrow Wilson and would eventually lead to World War II with the crazy Hitler. Hitler did not come out of nowhere. This was 
this was brewing and brewing and brewing for a very, very long time. And of course, we have the Jim Crow South. This is in New York, but the racism doesn't go away just because you cross the Mason-Dixon line. All right. We see Tom again on page 15 with the crunch of his leather boots. All right. So when he, even when he walks, he's crushing things. He's destroying things. And of course, he wants to impress Nick with his place and his sables. And he just, he's one of these guys you just want to hate. And you realize that Daisy is not getting romance from this guy. And he's so arrogant, his girlfriend calls up the house during dinner, right? And so, and then he shows his hypocrisy when he says, oh, Jordan's a nice girl. They should, they oughtn't let her run around the country this way. And Daisy's like, what? Who want her family? All right. So Tom is allowed to run around, but girls shouldn't be able to run around. Okay. Again, it's 1922. The 19th Amendment has been passed and women are finally enjoying freedom that men have had. But it's also the type of freedom to be promiscuous and not very, not very good, right? And then he says, with great irony, I think the home influence will be very good for her. Okay, his home is horrible, right? He does not care about his daughter. I, we, I don't even think he talks to his daughter once in this book, right? Even Daisy just wants her daughter to be a little fool, and. And his home, he's, he's having affairs. He's been having affairs since he's married Daisy, right? And Daisy, she is not as overtly racist and white nationalist as Tom Buchanan, but she does mention, oh, our white girlhood, our beautiful white girlhood. So this idea of whiteness plays a major role in the either, either overt or subtle racism that we see in The Great Gatsby that Nick doesn't, doesn't really partake in. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm just, but Nick is just the observer. He's going to take on um, Tom Buchanan on this issue. And, but Tom is the powerful one, and he's the one that seems to control everything, even though he's the biggest idiot in the book. Right. Something else to consider when Daisy says this about our our white girlhood. Daisy, white, right? Daisies are white, and they come in a variety of different colors, and you know, there's different uh, different types of daisies. But the basic daisy is white, purity. But at the center, yellow, right? So that's why you see the yellow and the white daisy so frequently, because at her center, she is totally corrupt, the color of gold, right? Um, but the white, she seems pure, but she's not pure, right? So Gatsby Fitzgerald is playing on the color imagery, uh, and also Daisy's, you know, boom, generally, and, and always in the summer. But he has all the money and all the power, and he wants to keep the money and the power. Right, so that's Tom Buchanan. Um, a fascinating portrayal, characterization, and a glimpse into the twisted world of the 1920s where there are so many great things happening technologically, but there are so many horrible things in regards to race and eugenics and anti-Semitism that would eventually boil over in the 1930s in the rise of Adolf Hitler and fascism in Italy um, and throughout the world with, with nationalism. And we all know what happened with nationalism in World War I. It, you know, sent the world into, you know, carnage.